So can I go, can I just get a little bit of context for the audience? Can I, can I get you to give me the, the 30 second pitch on air while expert, anyone that's not familiar with it, and then go into a little bit of, of, of your background? Yeah, yeah, sure. So for people who are not familiar, Airworks is essentially we're building a financial services platform for, for businesses, um, especially targeting those that may have some kind of international um, kind of slant. So for example, we can help with FX payments. Um, we have a cards product that doesn't have any you know, international transaction fees. Um, we can also help them set up bank accounts overseas. And so you know, our, our aim is really to help simplify business banking. Uh, and make it a lot more seamless and cost effective so that business owners can can really focus on their day to day uh, running of their businesses absolutely and then and then and then your own background neil i mean how did you end up headed you know heading growth and and marketing at air wallex yeah it's a bit about me so i i started off as a strategy consultant so i kind of did the you know um start off a bcg do a lot of consulting a lot of kind of high level thinking um move, move to london um mainly for personal reasons my, my wife's a fashion designer so she wanted to go somewhere a bit more exciting so we moved to london nice. Um, ended up in London for seven years, like thought I'd be there for a year, uh, year 10 to two into three into four and, and all by, by before we knew it was seven years. And, and I was really lucky um, when I was at in London that I joined um, Expedia. So they're kind of in the trouble space um, and, and essentially started working in digital marketing at, at Expedia. So that was kind of my first um, experience of, of growth. Uh, much more from on the consumer side, but learned a lot. And, and I think I was fortunate enough that at that time, it was a massive shift from offline to online travel. Um, so sort of benefits, benefits that. Um, finished yeah. my time. Yeah, so good. No, no, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, then decided to come back to Melbourne, kind of mainly, again, for personal reasons. Had a kid, decided to be closer to the family. Um, did, a, did a couple of years at, at Seek, uh, mainly on the product side. Um, and then Air Wallace kind of came, came knocking on my door uh, for head of growth and, Look, just super excited about the vision, you know, talking to Jack about the vision, about the opportunity, about the fact that they were based in Melbourne um, as well. Um, so yeah, couldn't, couldn't really say no to the opportunity. And then, and so here I am as, as head of growth of Airworks. So, so been at Airworks now for around 12 months. Yeah, absolutely. And Expedia, right? Can I, can I just start there? Because uh, I imagine you would have seen a tremendous amount of, you know, um, growth in the, in the team alone, right? So can you just talk a little bit about, um, you know, dealing with a company that's scaling and then also just, you know, how that kind of, you know, impacts, impacts your role. And then, cause I imagine that the, the role keeps changing as, as, as the, you know, the business is growing, plus you've got to, you know, take care of the scale of the operation itself. Can you just talk about Expedia, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was really lucky at Expedia. So I was pretty junior when I joined, um, but I was pretty lucky to see kind of the way, I think a pretty pretty leading edge kind of, I guess US US company manage manage the, the growth period. So I was I was actually specifically in a subsidiary of Expedia called Hotels.com and we were experiencing massive growth. So probably like fifty to one hundred percent growth um, year on year. Um, and I think what was really interesting was that at that stage, um, I think we were very clear on what was driving the growth. Right, what we were very clear on kind of what the key metrics that we needed to, to drive. And and these days everyone knows about it, but back then you know, this is like you know, ten years ago right, where e-commerce was still still pretty early stage. But we knew that conversion was was the goal. Like conversion was the hero. Like we had to nail conversion because that just had flow on effects everywhere, right? If we nail conversion, we're able to actually pay more in our, in our paid marketing channels, kind of get this flywheel happening, right? As you pay, as you're able to pay more in these kind of paid marketing channels, the way Google works is that it's very kind of exponential in, in the traffic. Like number one gets like, you know, 50% of traffic. Number two gets, you know, 30%. And it's kind of exponential relationship between paid marketing and, and where you can afford to, to play. Um, so really, really focus on conversion. It's like landing page improvement, test and learn, really focus on, on that. Um, and then also from a paid marketing side, figuring out how do you, um, you know, how do you scale the way you bid on Google or on kind of these price comparison sites through, um, you know, data science algorithms through automation. So, so I was really lucky to kind of be exposed to, to that aspect of, of growth. And, and do you like, and I imagine that these um, at simultaneously you're dealing with the fact that like the competition would have just like drove the numbers up on these, um, you know, paid marketing channels at very much at the same time. Right. Like, so how do you deal with, um, um, I guess, well, one is like staying number one, and two is, you know, are you just getting a bit more creative with, with, um, you know, how you're presenting yourself and, and competing against when the, 
you've got like a hundred hundred of these top tier companies with teams of you know 50 plus marketers around the world all competing on some of these keywords can you explain around how you'd kind of um you know navigated your way through that and yeah so i think there's a couple of levers we pull right so i think there's kind of the tactical lever within the marketing team which is all around how do you get visibility on what's performing well and what's not performing well um, and how do you do that at scale so there's a lot of kind of investment in automation around reporting so kind of like you know around understanding which keywords are uh, performing well not performing well and then also the tools to be able to improve those keywords at scale so if it's like an ad copy issue or if it's a coverage issue you have automation to really help um, the, I guess, the specialists optimize those keywords. So, so we invested a lot in automation and technology because we knew that was kind of something that we had to get right um, if we're going to play on a global, global level. I think the second piece is actually working really closely with your product team. And I think this is where like, you know, there are some things a marketer can do, right? Like there's within their power. But I think what I learned in Expedia at that scale is that to get a competitive advantage in growth, the, the product team and the marketing team have to work hand in hand. Like, you know, conversion is so essential to how well, uh, at least in the consumer space, how well a marketer can perform that you have to work really closely with, with that product team to make sure the conversion is, is right. And you know, there's kind of these trends now where actually these kind of conversion optimization teams are actually part of growth because there is just such a tight relationship between those two teams, right? But we work really hand in hand with the product team to make sure that they were doing a lot of testing and learning um, on, our, on our landing pages to drive that conversion up so we can afford to kind of keep that number one position. And, and our, our view is basically like, we can out convert um, our competitors because we have the scale, right? We have the data, more data than anyone else. Therefore we should be able to test and learn a lot faster, which means we should be able to get a higher conversion than our competitors. And then how do you like, you know, as you're saying this, I think they're kind of, um, you know, the lines between creative and 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 you know analytics seems to more and more get blurred right as you're kind of refining um the messaging and the comm strategy and stuff how um are you starting from a point where you're trying completely different creative or just variation and very and then you know kind of you know um working on the variations down to like optimize or are they kind of quite similar at the start and then where does where does the um, you know creativity end and, and analytics you know take over? I guess. Yeah, so I think that's, that's a really good question. So I think a couple of things on that. One is we, we're always data driven. Like I, I've been kind of instilled in that you have to be data driven as much as possible, right? So I definitely think that even when you're creative, you need to be data driven and kind of measure everything that that, that happens. Um, I think creativity also needs to be framed around what are the problems that you, you think the customer has and therefore what are the key hypotheses that you have to test. So anything we're doing around creative, we should be very clear on like, what do we think are the needs of the customer? Is it an emotional need? Is it, is it a, a need around pricing? Is it a need around convenience? Like really be very clear on what we think the hypothesis is. Um, and then when we're doing two different creatives, we should then be very um, clear on what are we testing? Like, do we think the need for price is, is stronger or the need for convenience is stronger and kind of test that against each other. Um, and then obviously measuring to see what, what works um, better. Um, when, when it comes to testing, I'm actually a, a, a big fan of testing two really different things rather than something too similar, um, just because you get a stronger signal. Um, so if you think about data, I mean, we were lucky we had like, you know, millions of data points, but not every business is like that. Um, so if you're testing something that's too similar, a lot of time you can't actually tell is it, if it's, is it a signal or a noise. So I'm yeah. much more of a fan of testing really different creatives, right? Obviously being very clear on what your hypotheses are, um, but testing quite different creatives. So at least the data will show you, hey, why is one working better than the other and be quite significant or quite clear in that, in that signal. Yeah, agreed. I mean, I think you're almost trying to narrow it down too quickly if you don't, if they're too similar at the, at the start. And then, and then moving forward to Seek, can you just talk a little bit about your role there and... Um, you know, how it was different and, and, and how you took that learning from Expedia to then tackle, you know, a completely different vertical. Yeah. So, so interesting enough, it's, it, it's different, but the same. So, so at, at, in an essence, online travel is like a marketplace. There's a two-sided marketplace. So yeah. you have to build out the, the supply side, which is like, you know, your hotels, uh, but you also have to build out the demand side, which is your customers. And, and having that kind of synchronize is really powerful because if you hire if you acquire hotels and then you have people they can send to those hotels 
then the supply gets really happy, then it helps you acquire more hotels. And then obviously if you have more hotels in the city, then the customer gets quite happy and they, they're more likely to use your platform. So it's kind of this two-sided um, marketplace. Um, Seek is actually very similar. It's a marketplace for jobs, right? So where instead of travel, it's, it's jobs. And it's very similar learnings. Like you have, um, you know, the supply side is essentially your, your job ads. Um, and what you find is generally the, the consumers who are looking for jobs are very industry specific. So it could be like hospitality. Um, it could be like, um, you know, technology, like whatever those verticals are. And so it's really important to build um, a critical mass of ads in these types of uh, verticals so you can actually attract those consumers or, or job seekers um, on the other side and then you kind of slowly build these verticals on your on your marketplace so so there are some similarities between um you know seek and, and hotels or, or even though you know, they sound quite different um in terms of my role it was actually very different so i think where i originally was much working a lot more on the on the marketing side at seek i was actually probably working a lot more on the product side um, and actually working with uh, both the Asia team and the, um, the Australia team figuring out how to actually consolidate into one platform. So, so one of the hypotheses was that to get um, faster uh, iterations of your product, you, you need a lot more traffic um, to get to test and, and learn. And to get that traffic, you actually want to consolidate uh, where you can the, the different product platforms. So at that time, Seek was running a different platform in Asia versus Australia. Um, so there's a real desire to actually consolidate those platforms into one and, and figure out how that um, can help them grow their product even even faster. Can we can we just uh, you know talk about that for a little bit and um, you know the um, I guess the you know the need of the needs of clients versus this kind of internal you know vision and roadmap. Um, in the product and then as it relates to growth. Can you talk a little bit about how you'd kind of manage, you know, um, what you wanted to do and where you wanted to kind of steer the ship versus um, features and the feature set that the, the, the clients wanted and how that kind of all merged into um, what, you know, what your focus be became? Yeah, so, so I, th I think at, at Seek, um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting space in that um, on the supply side, on the job side, right, we actually have quite a lot of big, big clients using us. Um, and usually with big clients, you have uh, a lot more feature rich, right? They might want, hey, I want this feature because it's very specific to their, to their use case. Um, as you go into kind of smaller businesses, it becomes less feature rich but it needs to become much more intuitive in its user experience. So they want to be able to say, Hey, I can, I can use this pretty, pretty easily. I don't need the depth of features uh, for the, for the kind of the, um, the, the larger companies, but I want it to be pretty, pretty intuitive to use. Um, I think, I think it's Seek where we were lucky in Australia that we actually had a very strong market position. So there probably wasn't a massive need on, Hey, I need to build these features to get more customers. It was more like, how do I build these new capabilities or products to one, um, cross sell or upsell to, to those customers and, and I guess get more share a wallet um, or to how do I build this to actually defend against um, uh, new incumbents or, or new competitors. Um, I think, I think for us, the, the, the strategy at Seek was actually very much about data. Like how do we use data and the data we capture on our platform to build an even better product, right? So I think when you're early stage, you're just trying to build a product to get, to get people uh, to use it. But as you grow, you want to almost kind of build like what we call data moats, right? these moats around your product that makes it very hard for a competitor to, to actually come in and, and displace you. Um, so the, the focus of the strategy is really around how do we capture a lot of data on our platform? And then how do we use that data to provide a better uh, user experience? Um, so for example, if you're like a, a job seeker, we obviously get quite a lot of data when you fill out your first application. Like it could be like, you know, your CV or your credentials or your, or your, you know, um, employment history, all that kind of stuff. Right. And so how do we use that and capture it in on the platform? So next time you apply for a job, uh, and it's actually a lot easier. You don't have to keep filling out this new information, right? You might auto apply. Um, how do we then use ma machine learning to actually say, Hey, we know a lot about your profile and your history. How do we actually do better recommendations for jobs for you? Right. And so that'll drive a lot of stickiness, um, on the, on the candidate side. Um, but also I think on the, on the, uh, the, the company side, they'll like that as well because ideally they get more relevant candidates applying for their jobs as well. So that, that was a really big focus uh, at Seek is how do you use kind of data to actually build better products that are very defensible 
Uh, and I'd say that's probably a unique position that Seek was in, um, that they were kind of number one in the market in Australia. So a lot of us are around defensive measures rather than kind of, you know, grabbing, grabbing share uh, in a new market. Absolutely. And um, all right, so on to AirWallX, um, you know, the main, main point of today. And, you know, it's been interesting, you know, I, um, I, you know, I, got, I got to interview, you know, Jack pretty early on and, and, um, and it's been incredible to kind of watch the journey and, you know, I, you know, I, I love seeing you guys, you know, fly, right. It's, it's fantastic. And I think, you know, and you know, it's, it's to the point, you know, I, I, um, people, are, yeah, I don't know. I just did it. I just pushed air wall X last week. It was just a timing of it with the podcast, but, um, so you get the tap on the shoulder from Air, Air Wallex, um, and this kind of courtship begins. But this couldn't have been too hard of a sell, given you know everything that's happened with Air Wallex. The products phenomenal, uh, the team's great. Can you just talk about how you got involved in Air Wallex and what kind of um, where you started and 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 um, where you're going? I guess. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think you know when when I um, was first approached, I actually hadn't heard of Airwalk, so it was pretty pretty new. I actually just wasn't aware of them. Um, but I did my research, and I was like, wow, these guys are really doing well and, and going places. So pretty excited about about the the company. Um, and then when I talked to all the people that were part of Airwalk, it got got me even more excited about the vision and about the opportunity. So I really enjoyed talking to Jack as well and kind of understanding his his vision for the company. Um, it wasn't probably too hard of a sell. Like, you know, they're Melbourne based. I'm based in Melbourne. So so really wanted to kind of um, you know, have an opportunity to, to, to work at a startup. And, and I think, you know, looking back on my days at Expedia, I really enjoyed the more fast paced environment. And I'd say that Seek is probably just a bit more mature in that stage. Um, so kind of you know, decided to, to join Airwallocks. I'd say that when I first joined, my, my initial focus was actually on the marketing, the digital marketing side of things. Um, to kind of set up a digital marketing team to really try to drive drive growth through the digital channels. Um, but I think, you know, even though that's gone well, I think where we are now is we don't want to just be driving growth through digital channels. We want to drive growth through other channels as well. So whether it's content, whether it's partnerships, whether it's, you know, direct sales, um, there's some of the other channels that we're looking at for, from a growth perspective. And that's actually become part of my remit is how do I drive, how do I set up those channels to continue to help drive drive our growth? Yeah. It, so this is this nice segue actually. So how do you, you know, how do you, how do you decide what the focal points are? And then when you get some like, um, you know, traction for lack of a better word in each of the channels, are you kind of, do you stick to those channels and optimize them before moving on? How, how is your kind of, your, you know, how does the growth plan look? Yeah. I'd say, I'd say at a high level, our growth plan is like, Hey, we want to hit this much revenue by, by X, right? So that's kind of a very more of a top down approach. Um, and then I think, you know, as all startups, you just have to try a bunch of things and see what sticks. So we, we try a bunch of different channels. So we try like partnerships. Um, we went on zero roadshow earlier this year before, before, you know, the lockdown. Um, we, we tried a bunch of digital marketing. We tried a bit, bunch of um, sales. Um, and then you just look at the data and you say, hey, what, what's coming through these channels? What, what does the quality look like? What does the unit economics look like? Um, and I think for us, like, you know, absolutely, we want to help small businesses. Um, but I think the reality is that small businesses just do small volume, right? And we essentially monetize on, on volume. And so when we look at some of these other channels like partnerships and sales, what we're getting from bigger businesses, like less number of businesses, but bigger businesses, we're like, hey, look, we think there's something in these channels as well. Um, and so based on that analysis, then we decided to say, hey, let's invest more in these channels because it looks like um, the return on investment is, is a bit better in these channels versus, versus others. And is it is the, you know, we, you know, you spoke about conversions earlier, although it was, you know, to do with Expedia. Um, are you... Are you looking at each stage of the funnel? I, I wanted to, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. One was just like um, how you approach, you know, you know, uh, acquisition and conversion, you know, the kind of, you know, pirate metrics kind of thing um, and how you prioritize that. And then I did want to get kind of get onto a conversation around community because I think that this is kind of, um, something that you guys are active in, but sometimes it's kind of overlooked as a way to, um, you know, think about engagement, what I consider both, the, you know, each end of the funnel. So, um, so two questions there, I guess, is one is how you kind of look at, look at the, the full funnel and, and how you kind of, um, um, you know, execute at each level and how you kind of work your way through that. And then um, 
and then your your thoughts on community as a as a as a growth model. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Yeah, so on the funnel, it's really interesting. I think I think growth through any channel, it, it's actually all about funnel, right? So I think it's really important to get a good view of what that funnel looks like and understand some of the drop offs. Um, obviously, when you're doing consumer, you, you usually have a lot more data, so it can, it can be very clear on kind of what that funnel looks like. Um, and also every user usually is a qualified user. Like if it's a consumer product and they're looking for like you know, hotels, you, you know that there's, there's generally a high intent to, to find the hotel. Um, when you're on the B2B side, it can actually be a little bit harder because one, there's not as many businesses as, as consumers. So the data is not, not as rich. Um, and secondly, not every business is qualified, right? So sometimes you have people sign up, but they're actually not a business, they're, they're, they're like a consumer, right? So it's a little bit harder sometimes to tease what, what that conversion looks like. Um, and I actually think in this B2B, it's really important early on for some person to start talking to your customers and getting that qualitative richness that you don't really get from just pure looking at the numbers. Um, well, yeah, because there's also, you know, um, an education process that you, you're trying to push at the same time, right? Exactly. So exactly. Like product. Yeah. yeah, both education and then also the feedback, right? Like the feedback of like, hey, why did you, how did you hear about us? Like, why do you want to use us? Like that's nuggets of gold, right? For our product team um, early on. And I think you just don't get that if you're not going to be talking to your customers. Like they just go through a normal digital marketing campaign, you lose some of that richness. Um, so we made a real priority for us to like touch everyone that kind of signed up and, and talk to them. Um, and I think a lot of our emphasis earlier was like, what is a qualitative um, kind of data we're getting uh, around the onboarding flow about why they're signing up. And that helps us then uh, informs us of where we want to optimize uh, from a funnel perspective, um, as well as like where, where other channels or opportunities there are for us to, to go after. So that's kind of number one. I think number two on, on the community piece, I think absolutely. Like the, the more we go into SMEs, the more re we realize how important community is and how important um, it is for this, these um, businesses to be able to help each other and support each other, right? Like super, super important. And, and the other thing you find is actually that a lot of these businesses can grow together, right? Like they, they they can kind of, you know, help each other with the different products or different services that they have. So, so you know, there are a couple of things we, we are looking into. Like one, we're actually about to relaunch a, a rewards program uh, for small business, uh, which really helps them just kind of figure out what are the right technologies they can potentially use if you're like an e-commerce business or a technology business. Um, and then give them a bit of a discount for, for those, for those um, um, products just to obviously help with from a cash flow perspective. Um, the other thing we're starting to look more and more into is how do we get more webinars up and running, like from a content perspective to really support these, these businesses and, and help bring experts, right? To help them with, with, with advice. Um, and the third thing which has actually been really pleasing is a lot of our um, employees are super excited with the different types of businesses that are using our platform. So, you know, today we actually just talked about a business called Croct, which is um, do-it-yourself home pottery, right? And, and they, they were one of the early users of, of Airwallocks. And we're starting now to think around how do we even just give our employees transparency around some of the businesses on our platform because they may want to actually like use these businesses and buy products um, from, from some of these businesses for, for either our business needs or their personal needs um, as well. Yeah. Well, absolutely. Right. It's a, it's a win-win. It's kind of like, you know, same reason we get support from cloud providers or whatever else is if we, you know, if, if they're, you know, introducing customers, um, to their customers, then it's kind of, you know, good for the, for the ecosystem. Um, and then want to just like, you know, I guess, um, you know, given the crazy period, right. I mean, um, you know, I, I did want to talk about it for a minute just to say, look, you know, how does like, um, you know, world, you know, more particularly in, in Australia, I guess is with this kind of the impact of, um, uncertainty and you know ambiguity ambiguity in 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 the world has that changed the way you are, are looking at growth or you know decided to you know emphasize different things as a as a, as a you know um as a result like can you explain some of the the things the learnings and and uh, i guess wins from from yeah yeah uh, that's a really good question so i think I, at a macro level um, you know, when, when kind of this all happened, I think we had to ask ourselves, you know, is this a fundamental uh, headwind for us in terms of our vision or, or, or tailwind? Yeah. Um, and we quickly realized that 
this was probably going to accelerate digital adoption, right? Like massively, um, accelerate e-commerce massively, um, accelerate digital payments massively. Um, and I think they were all some of the key trends that we were betting on as a business, right? Like we think, you know, the future is digital. We think the future is going to be digital payments and, and cross-border. So, so at a macro level, we were like, hey, look, very unfortunate situation, but it's actually probably a good thing uh, for, from a business perspective for us. Um, the, the next thing then was like, well, what are the needs of our customers during this time? And I think very early on, it was like, well, what does this mean for, for business? Like, what does COVID mean for business? So we did a bunch of content around what we think were going to be the losers and winners from this, like from an industry perspective to really help inform businesses and start, start thinking. You know, and our push was very much, hey, businesses need to start thinking about going digital. About going about going international right because there's just going to be constrained demand in, in the local local markets based on kind of the the, the situation we, we find ourselves in um, so that's kind of number one like like how do you invest in content and educate and, and kind of help people navigate through uh, this, this situation um, I think now like kind of you know coming coming almost like you know I guess six months after the situation you're finding a lot of businesses are really struggling from a cash flow perspective right? Like cash flow is, is super hard to, to manage right now in this environment. And so kind of what we're thinking now is like, how do we help businesses with, with cash flow? And, you know, we're pretty lucky that we can help both from a growth perspective and a cost perspective, like growth, obviously entering new markets, um, but cost also from like the savings versus, versus the big banks. Um, so we've been talking to a lot of businesses and I think they've been pretty appreciative of the fact that, you know, we are charging a lot less to the big banks um, we do have better service than, than some of the, the other players out there. And, and being able to unlock some cash flow, no matter how big or small, is going to help these businesses immensely. Right? So we really kind of focus on like, hey, how can we help you, you know, unlock cash flow so you can reinvest more in your business uh, for growth? Yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, case in point when you talk about, um, I, I don't see any major big banks on the phones. The customers probably trying to see how they could help um, you know, in like in the same kind of manner, right? Um, so, um, and then just, you know, um, just in terms of like, you know, I guess a random, random one, but has there been any unexpected wins or like, you know, winners, um, if it's, you know, your client, if your customers that have, um, been inspirational to you during the, during the same time? Yeah. I think, I think for me, it's actually just seeing the, the e-commerce, um, businesses take off, right? So the one I mentioned before, Crocs, they were like, you know, DIY pottery, home pottery. Um, and they've actually just found massive growth in this, in this environment. Like people, you know, need, need things to do, um, pretty hard to go buy stuff at stores and so they're buying, buying online. So, so definitely this, the, the e-commerce scene is, is really taking off. Um, and I think a lot of people are obviously migrating to that, to that space, both from a business and, and consumer perspective. So that's pretty pleasing to see um the other trend that we're seeing which i think has been happening in the last year or two already but more and more of these kind of eco-friendly type products um big yeah. demand um in that space so we have a couple one is called Subpod, which does like compost um but much easier way of doing compost so they're, they're an early adopter of ours they've been doing really really well um and there's a bunch of other brands that are kind of doing like eco-friendly type you know um, fashion or, or, or kind of other, other niche areas they're looking at. Um, I still seeing very good traction in that space as well. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, you know, I, um, he was speaking to uh, Australia post the other day and they were talking about, so almost like, um, you know, adjacent, um, you know, businesses were, were, were seeing growth because of the, you know, the, you know, the, the rise of e-commerce, you know, they, they also, they mentioned the, um, kind of eco-friendly packaging movement as well, you know, kind of that, because that is winning and that becomes, you know, winning marketing as well. So it's really interesting. Um, um, I just want to say thanks for your time, um, Neil. And um, yeah, look, I do want to end on, um, you know, what's the kind of call to action for people that are, um, you know, thinking about Air Wallex and, and, and um, um, yeah, I'm trying to give you a plug here at the end. I'm not. I'm yeah, yeah, no. Oh, really, to, yeah. yeah, yeah, really helpful, Chris. I mean, look, Look, with some of these businesses, like if you're starting a new business, like one of the things we've, we've heard is like, like they, people who use Airwalks can get their business set up a lot faster than go to the banks, 
right? So yep. we, we can give an account probably, you know, within a couple of days for most businesses. So that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, I think for a lot of other businesses that are looking global or international, we can save them quite a lot versus, versus the banks as well. So, so super happy to get, to get, you know, businesses onto Airwallet because they can just visit the website and, and sign up. Um, and then our team can help them get, get set up and, and going in no time. Absolutely. And one specifically, I wrote a note on this just the other day, I think it was from one of the social posts. Um, but there's a way to um, pay for your software subscriptions that are in the US using an AirWallex US account. I mean, I had these were adding up substantially for my own business. Um, so that's just a quick hack for people that are listening too, right? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, these days more and more businesses use subscription software um, and a lot of them charge in US dollar. Um, so our, our kind of debit card is zero international fees, um, especially if you're using things like AWS or, or drop shipping. Um, you know, some, some businesses use you know, tens of thousands a month um, and it adds up quite a lot from, a, from an expense perspective. So really keen to help any business uh, with this. Um, you know, use, use one of our cards, zero international fees, pull your subscription on it. Um, the other benefit we find is that we have virtual cards. So rather than a physical card, we're using the same number for every subscription software. Um, you can actually create different numbers for different subscription software. So in case you do lose a card, it's, you don't have to like spend hours trying to replace the details of every subscription software that you're using. So we find that a lot of customers really appreciate that as well. Well, wow. yeah, so it's a good hack to make them, you know, uh, startups and entrepreneurs are listening to make the money stretch a little bit further in COVID. Um, thank you very much for taking the time, Neil, and uh, loved hearing the chat. Um, loved hearing all the tips on growth. Really appreciate uh, it, Chris. Thanks for your time.